during my, my PhD work, uh, you, you know about that, uh, there's some labs that, I, that I've that i worked more closely with and uh, I've had the chance to exchange with uh, Apostolos and Laurent from the JRC uh, on the issue of mobile botnets and many other issues uh, before, uh, before Apostolos arrived, actually. <laughs> um, and, uh, and uh, but not because of that, but because he was chosen uh, by the program committee. Uh, he's going to present about the uh, platform that uh, they designed and uh, uh, further on with uh, Laurent uh, in uh, 40 minutes, uh, we'll get an update on uh, uh, their project. So Apostolos, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Apostolos Malatras, as Eric just said, and together with my colleague Laurent Bellet, we are going to, are going to present to you our work on mobile botnets, the particularities of mobile botnets, and an experimental platform, a hybrid experimental platform that we have designed and are in the process of developing to do a mobile botnet research in a systematic manner. First of all, let me thank, uh, thank you a lot the people from Kaspersky before who did a very good job at introducing the threat landscape of mobile malware and mobile botnets because it really validates the purpose of work like the ones that we are doing. Moreover, just let me apologize also in advance because I'm guessing you have seen our names, you know we're doing about mobile botnets. We have spammed you a lot in the last few weeks about uh, something that Laurent will talk about later. And thank you very much for your contributions in advance. So the outline of the presentation today is first I'm going to motivate to, to build a bit up on the motivation on why we're doing this work, why mobile botnets are an actual threat and what we're doing on trying to do some research on it and study them discuss a bit the particularities of mobile botnets and then I'm going to go ahead and present to you the design of uh, the experimental, the hybrid experimental platform that we have implemented in order to study mobile botnets in the lab and its implementation and some experiments that we've been, we've been planning ahead in this respect. Uh, so, mobile botnets, are, mobile botnets are a threat. They are out there. The botnets do not restrict themselves nowadays only to PCs, Macs, or other computing devices that are existing only in the home environment. As we'll see later on, the, the pervasiveness and the ubiquitousness of mobile devices and the fact that these devices have very advanced capabilities has allowed a lot of mobile malware to be de deployed and to, be de to infect a mobile device as well. The thing that motivates our research is the fact that we want to do some experiments with mobile malware. We want to study, to, to study how these are used to infect devices, how these uh, mobile botnets are propagated from device to device, how, ah, sorry, there's another part of the crowd here, uh, <laughs> how detection takes place on these kind of devices. And we found that there was not really nice uh, systematic uh, uniform organized manner of doing so. Uh, and by systematic, I mean that's something that would allow us to repeat experiments from other people and would allow other people to repeat experiments that we were doing. Because at the end of the day, when we're doing research, we would like to, to have this feature. I had this problem when I was doing my PhD. I was starting doing PhD on ad hoc networks in 2003. And there was no simulator back then, no emulator that everybody was using. So I was reading papers and seeing some results, trying to repeat these experiments, and these things didn't turn out to be as the things that I was reading. So it's similar with other, uh, other fields of study, networks and in particular, where we have well-established simulators and emulated platforms like Planet Lab, like NS2. We would like to have a similar platform in order to be able to do mobile botnet research. It would allow for a well-defined established way for experimentation. It would allow to facilitate the exchange of results and uh, discuss a bit more on the experimental settings. Uh, it would allow also to, to do more scalable and more flexible experiments because, let's face it, mobile experiments, mobile botnet experiments are kind of limited in the sense that when you're in the lab, it, it's kind of limited on the number of devices that are available to, to us. We cannot have hundreds of devices. So that's why we're, we decided to go for a hybrid platform, as I'm going to discuss, in order to allow for emulated and real devices to be integrated in the same environment. And it would definitely facilitate development efforts because we could do some trial and error before doing some actual things in the wild and uh, promote uniformity and common practices, as I mentioned there. 
So, mobile botnets and, mob and mobile botnet malware, as has been discussed already before, and it's actually a real threat. Uh, a mobile botnet is a botnet that it runs on mobile devices. And it's not something that came, uh, that uh, we decided, okay, ah, it's a nice thing to explore. Maybe somebody hasn't thought of it before. We started to, to study it and we started to do research about it because there are mobile botnets available out there. There are botnets that have defect, infected a lot of mobile devices. And actually, we have collected a few samples as well now lately. Uh, and this is the reason that uh, we decided to do research about it. It's a collection of compromised mobile machines that is run under a botmaster. And the reason that they are quite popular lately is the fact that, as I said before, mobile devices are pervasive. They're always with us. They're always on. They're always connected to the network, unlike some fixed computers or some, uh, at some home computers. So they're always connected to the network, and they allow operations, bottom operations, to be conducted on them. Moreover, there are quite a few security vulnerabilities, as was uh, covered for uh, in the presentations by the people from Kaspersky. The big fact is that there are a lot of different versions of operating systems, and each one of them has different security vulnerabilities. We cannot realistically expect that people patch up their operating system every single day so that to carry to to counter all these vulnerabilities and to reduce the number of uh, the, the number of risks. So the risks are still out there. Applications have different levels of permissions, and the permission model can be bypassed in order to conduct covert operations. And lately, we have seen a big convergence of mobile systems with uh, traditional computing systems. So mobile devices are used as backup for computing systems, so they're easily connected also to corporate networks, to fixed PCs. And this brings up a, a rich ecosystem where Bot masters and uh, malicious botnet uh, owners can have uh, their playground. Uh, why mobile botnets are particularly interesting? Another thing, is, another reason is that they're tightly linked to a user account. They're very personal because when somebody infects your device, nowadays we have a lot of stuff on our devices, from banking account information to personal information and photos. They are also, many of them are linked with now with paying system, mobile payment system. They are linked to, uh, to, to big monetary values, so people can still uh, your, uh, can use them to perform purchases on your behalf. And more importantly, personal information, personal and very sensitive information that can be used for ransomware later on and so forth. People can also use mobile botnets, and this has been established, to, to send SMSs to premium services, and that can get more lucrative gains. Mobile okay, botnets are, as always, composed of the standard staff, botmaster, CNC server, server, and client bot. The particularities of mobile botnets lay in the fact in two, two main things. Firstly, I'll go for the second one first, because I, I covered it before previously, the financial gains. So phones are acting as mobile wallets, SMS and premium numbers, people can steal a lot of money before you even notice it. So in a few, in a, in a few hours, people can steal a lot of money from your phone, and then you will get a notification from your bank, someone unusual activity has been noticed. The second then, one aspect that we find extremely interesting is the fact of contextualization. Mobile phones have a wealth of uh, sensor information on them, and they're also tightly connected to your user account. So when I say Onboard sensors can, use, uh, can be used to infer a lot of different context information. For example, your location, the state of the user, if he's walking, running, or if he's doing some other activity, proximity to other users, also preferences in terms of the user profile. All this information allows for more targeted and more focused types of attacks to be performed. So it's possible, for example, to be able to, to have a mobile botnet that targets the users only in this particular room or only in the vicinity of Paris, or people that only, for example, are uh, in a particular state, uh, only runners, and so forth. And this, uh, this ability to contextualize attacks makes it very interesting in terms of the attackers, because they can, uh, they can focus the target space in, uh, in terms of uh, their particular requirements. So, for example, for example, they could focus it on the on the, a group of employees of a particular company based on the proximity that has been noticed and the, the Wi-Fi access points that they are connecting to. So it opens up a, a nice, nice field for attack. Mobile botnets are, have some more technical particularities as well. 
in terms of dynamic IP addressing, because they're connecting to different access points all the time, they can be used, or also the 3G networks and 4G networks that people are using. There are particular constraints in terms of networking that are imposed by the cellular networks. So when you're using your 3G connection, you have to go through the telco uh, corporate network, the telco network, and so forth. As I mentioned before, and that's a big vulnerability, the fact that there is a huge number of different operating system versions uh, increases a lot the size of the vulnerabilities, the, the number of the vulnerabilities. The size of the screen is itself a vulnerability. We saw before about the hardware, how easy it is for people to get infected and download APKs on their phone. The fact that the screen is so small, sometimes we press things and you don't really know if you are accepting something or something, you clicked on something that you didn't know of. You have to zoom in sometimes in order to make sure that you clicked on the right thing. Uh, another very important thing is uh, the fact of the sensors, not only for contextualization, as I mentioned before, but sensors can be used and have been used uh, as a side channel for communication. So, for example, uh, the light sensor on the phone has been used to, to trigger a particular botnet command in the sense that the person is passing by in front of a, of a, of a pulsing light, and that pulsing light is detected by the sensor on the mobile phone as a particular type of command and interpreted like that. So. Uh, side signs for communication open up a completely new, new different way of for bot masters and CNCs to contact the bots that are installed on mobile devices. Clearly, that's really not well, uh, uh, that's not an aspect, a parameter that has been widely out there so far. It's a bit more exotic, but it opens up the opportunity for the attackers. And altogether, it's not a little tightly controlled ecosystem. It's highly recommended that we use the Google Play Store, or the Amazon Store, to download applications. But especially with the Google Play, off-market installations is a risk. And people are doing a lot of off-market installations. So when we work together with Eric on mobile botnets, we built a taxonomy of mobile botnet features in order to be able to classify the different particularities of mobile botnets in comparison to traditional botnets. And we studied different aspects like the network and connectivity issues, the platforms that people are using, the architecture, uh, different means to propagate the infection, uh, and the means that are used for this infection, the target of the attack, the motivation, impact, the detection. I will not go into detail on this because the focus of this presentation is mostly on the platform, and I see that I've been talking a lot about mobile botnets and not the platform itself so far. But in terms of the architecture, that's something that is interesting to no, know. It's that. Uh, on mobile botnets, we have the four different standard types of architectures, the centralized, hierarchical, hybrid, and mostly common are the peer-to-peer -peer ones, because uh, they allow, the, the, yeah, they're based on the proximity, and proximity is a feature that is well exploded in terms of mobile botnet malware. So, having said all this, we wanted, okay, not just to to map the domain, to map what is happening in terms of mobile botnets. We wanted to also to be able to, to test mobile botnets in the lab to see how they are used to infect, how they are used to propagate uh, in other devices. And in general, we want to support a variety of experiments in regards to mobile botnets. And we want to do it in a systematic manner. Uh, that's why we built, we started building, and this is an ongoing exploratory work, this ex hybrid experimental platform. When I say hybrid, it's because it's using both real devices that we have in the lab and that are part of the network of our ecosystem, but also emulated ones, and we're using emulators, uh, Android emulators for that. The platform we designed had a specific set of uh, design goals that are uh, and features. We wanted it to be generic enough so that it uh, covers a lot of different uh, types and architecture of mobile botnets but also different configurations for operating systems and different types of networks, from Wi-Fi and 3G to 4G and Bluetooth networks. Uh, eventually, we would like to cover other channels of communication, as I mentioned before. We want it also to be scalable. Mobile botnets can be as small as a few devices, a few tens of devices, but can grow up to thousands of devices, as some of the data was displayed before. Uh, and also, we would like to have the possibility to run experiments of more than one botnet would also like for the platform to be extensible, to allow for dynamic reconfiguration of the experiments, and be quite usable in the sense that we would want the, the users of this platform to, to write source code in order to be able to run an experiment. We wanted to do it in a user-friendly manner. For this purpose, we built this platform here, as you say. The important thing to note is, that, as I mentioned before, and 
I think this is something quite interesting to us as well, is the fact that this is a, the hybrid platform. We're also using actual devices that we're infecting and cleaning afterwards, and emulated devices as well. So even if uh, the malware itself has some, some of the malware that we would be testing have some sort of uh, testing for to, to realize whether they are running in a virtualized environment, we could also just use the standalone real devices for that. The focus of the platform, the, the main element, is the experiment manager. And the experiment manager module is where we go and define the experiment that we want to run. That experiment can, can be for a, as simple as there is this malware APK, install it on the devices and see how they are running together, what is happening, what is the network traffic that is being generated, where are these devices trying to connect to, whether they are discussing with each other. It can be also something more complex. So, for example, we could build, if it's a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, mobile botnet malware, we can build the, we can define the topology of the network that we want based on the devices that uh, are available to us. Uh, we could find also some uh, optimization criteria, for example, what to do when the, the, uh, the CPU utilization reaches a certain level, or what to do when we have collected enough data, or what to do if the network traffic is, uh, reaches a particular level. Uh, the experiment manager is used by the users at a very high level to define their experiment in the sense of number of nodes, num types of operating systems used. For now, it's just Android. But in theory, we should expand later on to other, uh, to other operating systems. And then we're using different modules as, a, as are shown here, the task analyzer, task allocation, optimization, and objective evaluation. These are used to, to parse the high level sort of natural language definition of the experiment given by the users to the low level, the low level instructions that are going to be passed on to the devices eventually. The task analyzer defines uh, breaks down the experiment into different pieces of uh, instructions to be given to the devices, and the task allocation assigns them to each particular device based on the requirements. So if an experiment can run only on an emulate device or only on, an, or on a real device, the objective evaluation is optional and can be used by the user to define when, whether a particular objectives will be set in order to run the experiment, and optimization keeps track of the whole operation of the experiment to see that uh, utilization of the resources is not exceeded. When the experiment has been defined and is ready to be, to be executed, we move on to the emulation manager, which is the core of the platform. And in there, uh, the actual communication with the real and the emulated devices takes place. So the high-level codified instructions are translated into uh, Android-specific or emulator-specific instructions to be sent to the devices by means of the setup and the execute modules. And the monitor module keeps track of whatever information is coming from the real devices, whatever information we have asked from it to monitor. So as I said before, monitor traffic, exchange information, exchange SMSs, and so forth. What is really important is the fact that, as I said before, the very interesting for us is the fact of uh, contextualization by means of sensor information. And that is really important for mobile botnet malware. Uh, that's why we wanted to have this included in the platform. We realized that if we just have a static platform with no sensor information available to us, it would be like another sandbox. Uh, so in this particular case, we have a, a module here in the settings where we're emulating realistic fake data, as we call them, uh, through this oxymoron. Uh, sensor data that is fed to the devices in order to emulate real conditions. So location, location is moved, uh, we can uh, select the, the, the desired uh, movement patterns of the nodes and have this location fed to the devices so as to emulate the GPS sensor. We can also have accelerometer settings uh, emulated, gyroscope settings, magnetometer, and so forth. And this way, the actual static devices that nobody is really touching and the emulated ones seems to be having some sort of a movement, seem to be having actual data to, to be exploited by the mobile botnet malware. The, the devices that are running can be quite a few. This actually depends on our resources, resources in terms of uh, money, because okay, the real device we have to buy and we have to set up and we have to maintain all the time. And the second resource is the computation power. So the Android emulators are running on a, cluster, on, on a server now, which will be expanded to a cluster of servers soon. And it's a matter of the CPU and the RAM that we have available to us to run more Android emulator instances. 
Uh, another important parameter is the results. The results are defined also at the beginning of the experiments and can cover different aspects uh, such as uh, propagation, infection, how many devices have been infected, how much uh, consumption of resources the mobile botnet malware uh, consumes, and so forth. Uh, the architecture, as we have, uh, we have designed, has been implemented up until now at a prototype level, and we are testing it for us for now. And eventually, we'll, when it becomes a bit more stable and more generic, will be shared. So what the platform can do at the end of the day is, first of all, test mobile botnets, infection, distribution, and detection. We can test different parameters in order to see how these parameters influence the infection distribution uh, aspects of the mobile botnet. And we can observe the, the operation of mobile botnets in a contained environment by means of real and emulate devices. The platform itself is not connected to the real, to any real network. It's, it runs in a contained uh, networking environment, so we don't have any instances of uh, actual botnets in the wild that are collaborating with the platform. Uh, the way we define the scenario, the, the way we, the platform works is by means of a definition of a scenario. So the user of uh, the, the one that wants to run some sort of experiment with mobile botnets, they define the scenario which is like a list of events. So they have a series of steps uh, that uh, show the, the way they would like their experiment to run. For example, first step, infect the, uh, the botnet, install the malware, keep track of this and that, X and Y parameters, and so forth. Uh, clearly, we can run the experiment in a remote manner. So, the, where where the actual devices are and where the servers are can be done. Uh, configuration can be done in a remote manner, uh, and so we can have a data center there. Hopefully, uh, we can collect the results and runtime measurements. We can integrate realistic sensor data and can run parallel parallel experiments. So, more than one mobile botnet running at the same time. Clearly, subject to the availability of the resources, which. At this level are quite restricted since it's just for us. Uh, the platform that I just described, we have started implementing with, by means of open technologies, basically using Java technologies. In terms of the emulator, we're focused now only on the Android platform because the security model can be, can be bypassed here, as I said before, with the root access. So we're using the Android emulator for the emulated devices and rooted devices for the real devices. The Android debug bridge is enabled on all devices so as to allow them us to communicate remotely with them. Configuration is defined. The scenarios that I mentioned before with events are by means of XML configured files. And the realistic fake sensor data, is we're using an open source tool called Sensor Simulator for that to integrate in the platform. So the infrastructure up until now is be, has been, yeah, we've been testing it in in scenarios like this, so the server, the main server where the Android emulators are running, kind of currently uh, mimics the behavior of the botmaster. So the botmaster setups the, the configuration that they want, and we're using a Raspberry Pi uh, to have as a CMC server. The reason that we use the Raspberry Pi and not another server is the fact that we wanted the CMC server to to emulate something more realistic in a mobile environment. The fact that the CMC might be in a more portable type of device and more, restra and more restrained in terms of resources. Android smartphones are controlled by means of the Raspberry Pi, uh, and the same happens with Android emulators. Uh, when, playing, uh, when playing around, when testing the platform in our lab and playing around with it, uh, communication between these devices happens by means of uh, XMPP. So this has been, we're using this as an infection vector and for devices to communicate with each other and to the CMC server. Some restrictions here in terms of the networking. Since, we, as I said before, for reasons of security, we don't want to mess up with real installations of mobile botnets. We don't have wide internet access uh, connected to the platform. Uh, all devices are connected through the Wi-Fi network, through the same Wi-Fi network. This is a restriction that we use just for the fact that uh, it allows us, if the device are in the same network, to have full interaction with the devices. In theory, we could restrict this scenario and have devices connected from different networks, but we would have some sort of, we would need to have a telnet daemon running on the different devices in order to be able to communicate with them remotely. Uh, 
an issue that is, uh, that is quite problematic for now is how to set up the topology of the different devices if we wish to have a, some sort of a custom topology. The thing is that, the thing is that uh, IP addressing is a bit hard when it comes in particular to the emulated devices because each Android emulator has its own IP behind the virtual router of the Android emulator and we have to use some port re redirecting, a lot of hard-coded port redirecting in order to fix uh, the desired topology. And another aspect that we plan to, to work on is, okay, we have, and it's a restriction that we understand that is, it's there, is the fact that we're using Wi-Fi network and since we're talking about mobile botnets, we cannot ignore the fact that they might be running on 3G networks, 4G networks. So in collaboration with some other people from our lab, we're going to, to start working on traffic shaping to emulate the features of uh, the particularities of 3G connections and cellular networks. Uh, as I mentioned before, the scenarios are defined using a specific XML schema that I'm going to show to you just for the sake of information. It doesn't really say anything as it is now, <laughs> but basically what it does is we can define the different types of nodes and the different topologies by means of neighbors, the different steps, uh, the duration of the experiment, different types of conditional and exit conditions to exit the experiments, uh, types of results, and the different steps. Uh, in theory, yeah. This is something a bit more user-friendly than writing specific uh, code, but it can be improved, and that's something we have realized. So, we have, as I said before, we define different steps to define the scenario executions, and this can be conditionally triggered or triggered by means of specific timers. Um, and let me just briefly cover another complementary aspect that we have been working on. Uh, so, w when I said at the beginning we, we started doing research on mobile botnets and to study their particularities, uh, we had some things in mind. So, one of the things that we wanted to test is whether we are able to, to count the number of active bots in a mobile botnet. And for that, we, we developed an algorithmic method based on a variant of the Jolly Seber model. This is a, a model borrowed from a theory in, uh, in bi biology in order to measure the number of species encountered in the wild, uh, number of zebras, for example, when you don't know the exact number of zebras, and so forth. So uh, this is a completely statistical method, so it's to be understood that it does not give exact and accurate results, but gives a very good indication on the number of bots in the botnet uh, in a relatively short amount of time. So the idea behind this is it's a capture and recapture method. So we have a big population, the entire number of ecosystem of devices, at, uh, and some of them are infected with the botnet. So at some point in time, we go and capture some of these devices, and by means of capturing, I mean monitoring, monitoring their IPs, monitoring uh, their unique identifier, and we mark them. So these four devices at some point, at some point in time are marked as having installed a specific uh, mobile botnet malware installed on them. Then we release them by means of releasing. I mean, okay, in the real world, we capture the animal, then we release it in the wild again. Here, we just mark it and keep it for future reference. In another point of time, we have another set of the population, another set of the mobile devices that we are monitoring again. Two of them already existed before in the previous set as well. So we go and recapture some, another, the same number of devices, four devices again, and one of them has been captured for the same time. Assuming that there is a normal distribution of mobile botnet malware uh, amongst the, the set of all devices, the number of devices that was marked for the second time over the number of devices that were marked altogether should be uh, proportional to the, should be equal, the proportion is equal uh, to the number of devices that were marked in the, in the first time. So all these, the, the yellows and the reds, the yellows and the reds, uh, have been uh, monitored and have been, have been observed by us, so we have these numbers. So we can easily calculate the number of infected devices altogether. As I said before, this is a statistical method and gives an indication of how many active bots are out there in terms of particular mobile bot and malware. But this indication is relatively good and it can become better and better if we have a lot of rounds of capturing and recapturing. And this is an experiment that we are planning to run, uh, the, the one that we are currently running in our experimental platform. Uh, just uh, as a hint, as I said before, we need to monitor, we need to 
to, to see how many devices are actually uh, carrying the mobile botnet malware. When it comes to centralized and hybrid mobile botnets, the way to do this is by means of implementing a specific uh, a honeypot in order to monitor infected instances. Uh, and in terms of peer-to-peer mo -peer mobile botnets, it's much easier if we have devices, actual devices of our platform, infiltrate the mobile botnet and periodically collect the number of nodes that are in their peer list in order to communicate with. So let me go to our conclusion slowly, slowly so you can have time for questions later on. As, I'm, as we said many times today, mobile botnets are emerging into the scene. They're actually not only running on mobile devices, but they are spared by the fact that there is a convergence of traditional mobile ecosystems and uh, it's uh, the pervasive nature of mobile phones, always on, always connected, uh, gives ground to a lot of more se serious attacks to occur using mobile botnets. Having said that, there is a need for systematic research efforts to do this in a manner that can be repeated and can be shared by other researchers to, uh, with other researchers. And in this respect, uh, uh, research has been quite dispersed so far. In this, uh, accordingly, we proposed a hybrid experimental platform in order to study mobile botnets and to highlight challenges and different opportunities. Hopefully, this will be something that can be shared in the next, uh, uh, in the next period of time with uh, the rest of you, and we can all make use of it. Thank you very much for your attention, and feel free to ask me any questions you want. Any questions at this stage? Yes. Hi, thanks. Uh, great talk. Just a question. Did you have um, difference between the actual devices and the uh, emulated devices? Uh, some of the mobile buttons cannot run on the emulated device in the sense that they can realize that they are running on emulated devices since they are not executing at all. Moreover, there is a matter of, uh, the matter of resources. So the real device that we have are uh, at the latest ones, basically. So they are much more advanced in terms of the resources that they have uh, compared to the previous, uh, to the emulated ones. So that's another aspect uh, that's quite different. Another no. question? Tom? <laughs> Excellent. So I did a very good job at presenting. Hi. Hello. Uh, you mentioned peer-to-peer -peer communication. Have you encountered a case of uh, low-level radio communication? NFC mean? I mean, mean not over IP, IP uh, but low-level radio communication using standard radio. Uh, not, uh, if I have encountered, no, to be honest, the correct <laughs> the short answer is, but yeah, it could quite be possible. For example, with Bluetooth in a contained environment, could be quite possible. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, 